Good evening, everybody. We are live from Chicago on this Tuesday night, uh, ready for another spooky story Tuesday spectacular. And my compadre here is messing up my camera. I have a little snake. He is... There we go. And we're back. Um, I hope everybody's been doing well wherever you are. And thank you to those of you who joined me uh, last week for my um, virtual launch party. That was so much fun. And this week our theme is going to be cemeteries. So I'm trying to get the snake off of the computer equipment here, but I might just let him be for a second. But I do have Pepper here to, joining us this evening as my special guest. He's just not cooperating. Um, I did want to show everybody the book. Oh my lord, here it is, this house. It came in the mail, uh, or it, my book baby was delivered uh, successfully, and it feels really good, and it's so cute and so special, and I'm so excited um, to have gotten it. So uh, thank you to everybody who also ordered a copy, or if you want a free copy, if you are April or, or if you are Anicia, you will uh, be getting yours in the mail one of these days. All right. Oscar's causing a ruckus, everybody. Okay, so tonight we have a fun lineup. I'm gonna try to keep it to a half hour. I know that you guys probably don't really care, but for me, uh, I wanna try to, you know, keep to my promise and not, not keep you guys here forever. Hi, Scott, good to see you here. Um, so uh, tonight we're gonna read another one from In a Dark, Dark Room. This one is going to be called, I believe, aptly named In the Graveyard followed by a tale from the book Spooky Maryland uh, by S.E. Schlosser. So this is like folk tales uh, that have been reinterpreted. They're very cool. I'm excited to share this one, which is called Open Grave. Then I'm going to read something from Scott Larson's Visitations comics. So this is just a shameless plug for me. It's a little article that I wrote about uh, a cemetery here in Chicago, City Cemetery, which is now Lincoln Park. And then uh, Scott does these awesome, awesome uh, books that I want you to check out called Visitations. Then we're going to read about uh, From the Graveyards of Chicago by Matt Huckey, I think is how he pronounces his name, and Ursula Bielski, um, another cemetery here in Chicago that is oft untold about, and that's the Reed Dunning Memorial Park. Uh, so this will be less ghost story and more um, interesting history tidbits. And then we're going to end on kind of a darker note with a story from uh, Jeff Belanger's The World's Most Haunted Places, and we're going to talk about the suicide forest near Mount Fuji in Japan. So that's tonight's lineup of tales about cemeteries. I do have a snake to show you. He is currently wrapped around the microphone, so I will um, see if he decides to uncoil at any point throughout uh, the presentation, but you might have seen his tail at the very beginning. Um, and then I'll show you guys one more time the copy of this house that I got in the mail this week. It's freaking gorgeous. It's really cute. I'm so proud of it. And I can see that it has a little stain at the top and I'll have to fix that. All right. So let's get started. Hope everybody's having a good week. Happy Tuesday, corn, corn Tuesday. All right, ready? We're gonna start with In the Graveyard from our dear friend Alvin Schwartz. A woman in a graveyard sat. Ooh, very short and very fat. Ooh, she saw three corpses carried in. Ooh, very tall and very thin. Ooh, <laughs> I'm not gonna sing it out the whole I'm not going to belt it out for you. I'll let you use your imaginations. To the corpses, the woman said, Will I be like you when I am dead? Ooh. <laughs> to the woman, the corpses said, You will be like us when you are dead. Say it with me. Ooh. There we go. Getting that in there. I love these illustrations. And to the corpses, the woman said, ah! <laughs> I 
there you have it, folks. Folklore at its finest. All right. Let's move on to something else a little more sinister. Open Grave from Spooky Maryland by S.E. Schlosser. And she's done some other books as well about different states uh, and their folklore. And this tale allegedly comes from Venton, Maryland. Cancer took hold of my sister real quick the summer I was 19. I was still living at home with my folks, but Rachel was married and lived on a farm just outside of Venton. Her husband ran off when she took sick. Seems they hadn't been getting along too well, though Rachel had never complained to us about it. Anyway, Rachel had nowhere else to turn, so we brought her home and took turns nursing her and, and amusing little Lacey, her four-year-old daughter. It was hard watching my big sister dying by inches. Rachel grew pale and thin until she couldn't get out of bed. She went from feverish to freezing cold in an instant, and we had to carry her out to the privy because her legs would no longer bear her weight. Little Lacey wanted to play with her mama and didn't understand why she couldn't. It was almost as hard to hear the little girl crying as it was to see Rachel gasping in terrible pain. The doctor kept her drugged up as much as possible to ease her discomfort, but she hated the vagueness it caused, hated not recognizing her own family, she would take the medicine only when the pain became unbearable. At the end, Rachel faded away. She was a pale ghost, her fair hair scattered across the pillow, and her blue eyes focused already on a horizon we could not see and where we could not follow. We set up a cot in the kitchen so she could be at the center of the family action. She liked to watch mother cooking, father reading the newspaper, and me sewing or knitting the clothing I sold to the local shops. Little Lacey would perch beside her mama, brushing her mother's fair hair and singing songs to make her feel better. One midsummer night, mother and I sat with Rachel as she drifted off to sleep, listening to her breathing become faint and watching the lines of pain fade from her face as she stepped across that divide that every human must one day cross. We each held one of her hands and cried together when she was gone. Father dug a shallow grave for her in the family plot at the back of our property, and all our friends and neighbors came to comfort us as we lay Rachel to rest. Little Lacey didn't understand what had happened and kept asking everyone she saw where her mom had gone. No one knew how to answer her. It was about a month after Rachel died that I looked up from my sewing to see a thunderstorm blowing up right quick. Little Lacey was playing out back and Mother and I ran outside and called for her to come in. Mother's got a bad hip so she sent me to search for the child before she got herself hit by lightning. I raced toward the copse of trees behind our house calling for Lacey. Then I saw a chubby figure come rushing out of the woods near the family graveyard, her fair hair blowing wildly in the heavy wind whipping ahead of the thunderstorm. Aunt Sadie, Aunt Sadie, I heard her little voice calling to me above the rush of the wind and the almost continuous roll of thunder. I dropped to my knees and caught the little girl in a hug, noticing that Lacey was trembling with excitement. Aunt Sadie, I saw Mama back there. Lacey pointed toward the graveyard and then tugged my hand. Come on, hurry. She said she couldn't stay very long. My body tensed and icy fingers seemed to trail up my arms and legs when I heard her words. Lacey, honey, we have to go inside. It's about to storm, I protested. But the little girl broke away from me and ran back toward the family plot in the woods. I followed and reached the fence around the graveyard just as a flash of lightning lit the sky directly above us. In that flash, I caught a glimpse of Rachel's grave. The ground all dug up and the lid of her coffin open. Standing in front of the tombstone, one foot inside the coffin and one out, was a glowing white figure with its hand outstretched toward Lacey. No, I screamed, no! Speckles of light winked all around my eyes in the aftermath of the brilliant lightning flash as I leapt forward and grabbed Lacey. The child kicked and screamed when I dragged her toward the house, refusing to look back at the graveyard. Put me down, put me down, screamed Lacey. Mama says I'm to go back with her. The deluge began before we reached the house, but I was already soaked by the child's tears when she realized I would not let her return to her mama. Little Lacey sobbed out the whole story to mother, who was horrified by the tale and sent her quickly upstairs to change. I didn't tell mother what I had seen, for fear that speaking the story aloud would somehow make it true. Mother must have guessed something of the truth from the look on my face, but she didn't press me for details. She was frightened too. After the storm, Father walked all around the property cleaning up debris. He came back to the house to tell us that the water had washed the dirt away from Rachel's grave, and he'd been forced to dig the hole deeper this time and rebury her. Mother and I carefully did not look at each other while he related this strange occurrence. 
I kept a close watch on Lacey over the next several weeks and would not let her play in the woods again, no matter how much she begged. Day after day, nothing happened. Gradually, I relaxed my vigil, deciding that I must have imagined the whole incident in the graveyard. That dazzling lightning flash had played tricks with my eyes. That was all. One afternoon in early fall, Father hitched up the wagon and went to town. He asked me to go along, but I had a backlog of sewing to do, so he took little Lacey instead. As they drove along the lane, past the copse of trees where the family graveyard stood, a furry white animal, Father never knew exactly what it was, came running out of the underbrush and spooked the horses. They reared up in the traces and then took off in fright. Little Lacey was thrown from, from the wagon before Father could catch her and died instantly of a broken neck. It was exactly one month to the day after we'd seen Rachel's spirit beckoning to her from the open grave in the family cemetery. And there's the illustration. All right, let me try to get Pepper so that you guys can see him. He is so into this keyboard right now and he's wrapped around the microphone and is very much not into uh, having company right now. Maybe you can see his tail, snake tail. Tails from the snake. Yeah, he's very annoyed right now. Hello, I'll work on it. Let's go to the next story. Pepper's a special one. It's a special boy. All right. So the next thing that I'm going to share is going to be from the Visitations comic. This is by Scott Larson. He's a local artist. You guys um, will remember him also because I did some panels with him at some different Comic Cons. And um, he is up to, I think, the fourth or fifth one in the series now for Visitations. And I uh, got to submit an article slash story slash essay about um, the little known city cemetery of Lincoln Park um, to go along with his comic book, which is themed around haunted um, cemeteries in Chicago. It's a little bit of history. It's a little bit of ghost lore. Um, all right. So let's read about Lincoln Park City Cemetery. And then I'll work on getting Pepper untangled from the mic again. Buried beneath the surface of Chicago's sprawling Lincoln Park are the remains of one of the city's best kept secrets, City Cemetery. Lincoln Park is Chicago's largest public park, attracting millions of visitors every year from around the world to its zoos, museums, beaches, harbors, lakefront trails, sports facilities, and more. The majority of people who traverse the park, even those who call Lincoln Park home, are not aware that some 12,000 former residents lie in eternal repose just below their feet. In 1837, the state of Illinois dedicated a large plot of land to bury Chicago's dead outside of what were then the city limits. During the 1840s and 1850s, more than 35,000 people were interred at what came to be called City Cemetery. The city quickly grew up around the cemetery and residents found themselves living in close proximity to the deceased. Concerns grew that bacteria from decomposing bodies, many of which had succumbed to cholera, could contaminate the city's water supply as the cemetery was located so close to Lake Michigan and the bodies were buried below the water table. Residents also found the prospect of living so close to the dead rather grim. The last lots at City Cemetery were sold in 1859 and the last burials took place around 1886. After Abraham Lincoln's assassination in 1865, the area was named Lincoln Park in his honor, and in 1869, the Lincoln Park commissioners assumed responsibility for the cemetery grounds. Between the late 1860s and 1880s, the city undertook the immense project of moving all of the bodies and grave markers in city cemetery to outlying cemeteries. At the time, these rural cemeteries were primarily Rose Hill, which opened in 1859, and Graceland and Calvary, which opened in 1860. The city was successful in moving most of the grave markers, with only one monument remaining in place today. The Couch Tomb was built in 1858 to house the remains of wealthy Chicago hotel owner Ira Couch and his family, and sits today on the grounds of the Chicago History Museum. And this is a picture of it. There you go. I lost my place. There we go. Although sometimes mistaken for an old shed by passersby on West LaSalle Drive, the mausoleum is possibly the oldest remaining structure in the Great Chicago Fire Zone and is shrouded in its own myths and legends. 
Unfortunately, the city was not quite so successful in moving all of City Cemetery's bodies. The cemetery's primary researcher and advocate, Pamela Banos, has estimated that as many as 12,000 people are still buried beneath Lincoln Park. Many of the city's or many of the cemetery's grave markers were destroyed during the Great Chicago Fire in 1871 when the fire swept through the cemetery and surrounding areas, famously forcing some residents to hide in open graves to escape the flames. The fire, along with poor record keeping, lack of manpower, and outright scandal were all significant factors which contributed to the failure of the city to disinter and reinter elsewhere all of the bodies. Additionally, there was a large potter's field where many of the city's poor were laid to rest in a mass unmarked grave as well as some 4,000 Confederate prisoners of war who had been imprisoned and died at Camp Douglas on Chicago's south side during the Civil War. The Potter's Field is located below what are now Lincoln Park's baseball fields. It would be remiss not to mention Suicide Bridge in conjunction with Lincoln Park's hidden history. In 1894, a high bridge was built over the lagoon that runs parallel to Lakeshore Drive. This bridge came to be known as Suicide Bridge, so infamously that it was even designated as such on postcards of the time. Until it was permanently closed in 1919, as many as 100 people committed suicide there, typically by jumping or hanging themselves from the bridge. The bridge attracted morbidly curious spectators from around the city who would visit in hopes of witnessing a death. As early as the 1880s, ghost stories began to circulate about the park and its deceased inhabitants. Many of these stories continue to circulate today, fueled by the ongoing discovery of coffins, bodies, and body parts throughout the park. In 1962, a skeleton and coffin were unearthed during the construction of the barn at Lincoln Park Zoo. Both skeleton and coffin were reburied and remain beneath the barn today. In 1998, 81 bodies and parts of bodies, along with a cast iron Fisk metallic burial case, were excavated during the construction of the Chicago History Museum's parking lot. These remains became property of the state of Illinois under the Human Skeletal Remains Protection Act and many are now part of the collections of the Illinois State Museum. As recently as 2013, human remains were discovered during construction on a home built over an area of the cemetery that is now part of the Gold Coast neighborhood. Undoubtedly, Lincoln Park and the inhabitants of City Cemetery have many stories left to tell. If only they could speak and tell us their tales. Or perhaps, if on a clear night with the moon hanging low over the lake, we could pay a visit to the park and our respects to its dead and just listen. All right, so that is a tale about City Cemetery, which is today Lincoln Park. Let me see if I can get a snake tail here. Ooh, I got you. Oh, he's so angry. All right, this is our little doodle bug, Pepper. He is a feisty one. Yeah, hi, buddy. Pepper's a hog island boa. He's about a year and a half old. He's a little small for his age. We're uh, focusing on helping him grow. Um, and uh, yeah, he's a beauty, huh? He's a beauty. Look at that beautiful tail. All right. Yes, I know. He just likes to sit still and be a chill dude. All right. My faithful assistant, Jonathan, will now take the snake. Nope. All right. Bye, buddy. What a cutie pie. Okay. Moving right along. There's Jonathan in the background. Very exciting. Everybody wave to Jonathan. So there's another little known cemetery burial area um, in Chicago uh, called Reed Dunning Memorial Park. And I wanted to read to you uh, from the book Graveyards of Chicago by Matt Hookie and Ursula Bielski about that. Um, so I see comments about uh, Archer Avenue and Resurrection Cemetery. Um, and I shared a story, uh, shared a couple of stories that had to do with the legend of Resurrection Mary and some of our earlier um, Spooky Story Tuesday sessions. And I kind of wanted to focus on these tonight because they're definitely a little bit interesting, a little bit um, different. Um, so, and, and Reed Dunning is a particularly fascinating place to me. So let's read about it and uh, hopefully you will find it to be as fascinating as I do. All right. 
From 1851 through 1910, an expanse of land at Irving Park Road and Narragansett Avenue in the then sun suburb of Dunning was utilized by the county as a hospital, tuberculosis sanitarium, insane asylum, and poor farm, with burials from the dead of each institution taking place on the grounds. Though much of the land was built over, use of portions of the land as a mental health facility and children's home has continued into the 21st century. The facility today operates under the name of Chicago Reed Mental Health Facility, located on Oak Park Avenue, just west of the Memorial Park, though the complex has come to public scandal time and again, charged with unsanitary conditions, unnecessary restraint of patients, neglect of mentally disabled children, and other atrocities. As for the larger property of the original asylum, only in recent years were the abandoned portions of the old site unearthed, including human remains, during the breakup of land for the building of Wright College, the Ridgemoor Estates residences, and a shopping complex called Dunning Square. The complex, known for a century simply as Dunning, was first opened as a county poorhouse in 1851, a place where indigent individuals and families lived and worked <clears throat> an adjoining farm. The Dunning Poor Farm sprawled over more than 150 acres owned by Peter Ludby, a farmer whose rights to the land were that of a squatter's, circa 1839. Seven years after the Poor Farm opened, the Cook County Insane Asylum was completed on the acreage, directed by a Dr. D.B. Fonda. From the beginning, underfinancing and overcrowding were problems. Despite the inadequate resources, the need for a larger facility became increasingly apparent and, in 1871, the year of the Great Fire, a new structure was completed that was serving around 600 patients by 1885. Two fires at the hospital in 1912 and 1923 destroyed great portions of the asylum structures and sent the city into a panic when, each time, a number of inmates escaped from the grounds. New construction soon began to replace the destroyed infirmary buildings and, in the summer of 1912, Cook County transferred the property and institution to the state of Illinois. The name was officially changed to, the name was officially changed to Chicago State Hospital, though for Chicagoans the Dunning moniker would always remain, its name calling up to this day fearful images of the hopelessly insane retained under the most horrific conditions. In the late 1980s, Pontarelli Brothers, a pro prolific Chicago real estate developer, purchased the land with the intention of building a residential community on the old Dunning grounds. When digging began, workers began uncovering human remains in astonishing numbers. Archaeologists at Loyola University were hired to excavate and many university students volunteered to assist in the painstaking process. It revealed that at least three separate cemeteries had occupied the land, containing remains from a variety of sources. Records had shown that in 1876, 633 bodies were buried at Dunning, including those from hospitals, an orphanage, a house of corrections, and a home for the friendless. Adding to the burial site were unclaimed victims from the Great Fire, penniless veterans of the Civil War, the dead of the poor farm, and Dunning inmates who had perished as patients. Many among them were the bodies from the potter's field at the original city cemetery in Lincoln Park, which we just learned about, which were reportedly moved to the poor farm after the cemetery was closed. Reed Dunning Memorial Park, the only memorial to the Dunning dead, was built on a three-acre tract of land set aside for reinterment of the remains found at the Dunning site, and today the site is reportedly complete. The final design reveals a snaking pathway through grass fenced off from surrounding industrial and condominium complexes connected by seven concrete circles, here and there decorated with artifacts from the old Dunning complex. At its dedication on December 18, 2001, the remains of the 182 disturbed graves were reburied in an official memorial service to dedicate the park. Visitors to the area, area Area and students of history, however, should be aware of the fact that researchers still place the likely body count on the larger Dunning property at around 38,000. That's the same number of people that were interred originally at City Cemetery. All but those 182 moved to Reed Dunning Park, presumably plowed under and built over by developers. Now, if you want to visit a sad place, you can go to the Memorial Park as described, I was there last year, was it last year? In the fall, I think, that we took a trip there. Mm -hmm. And um, it is an eerie, sad, despondent location, um, fit, fitting for, for, the, for its theme. Um, 
and it's it's an easy drive um, or bus ride I think to, to well it's a long bus ride to, to get out there if you're interested in visiting so that is about the Reed Dunning Memorial Park and Cemetery I find it so interesting that 38,000 came, that number came up twice. And I see that um, Scott also shared in the comments about the Lake County Poor Farm. Thank you. Um, and I also know that they started to build a school, this was only two or three years ago, somewhere over there, uh, where they were expecting to unearth bodies from the redunning uh, that cemetery and they were actually digging with special kinds of like plastic shovels because they were anticipating hitting bodies and they had archaeologists on site ready to you know excavate and they continued with building a school for kids uh and just said this is this is it this is what we're doing and if we hit bodies so be it sweet home chicago all right our final story is going to be uh, the darkest of our offerings for the evening. It's called Suicide Forest, and many of you have probably heard of this. Uh, interesting place, and I'm going to be reading from the World's Most Haunted Places, you know, the 937th edition by Jeff Belanger. And here's a picture of Mount Fuji, just in case you don't already have one in your imagination. All right. Already I cannot pronounce this. Let's see if I, let's give it a go. Aikogi, Aoki Gahara Jukai, which lies in the shadow of Japan's iconic Mount Fuji, is an enchanted, haunted, and haunting forest. It's also called the Sea of Trees, and from higher elevation you can see why. It looks like a calm and gently rolling canopy of woods, but the serene surface hides something very dark underneath. The Sea of Trees isn't the only nickname for this area. The Jukai's best known moniker is Suicide Forest. Depending on what list you read, the forest rivals only San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge as the world's most popular location to take your own life. Dozens of people each year walk into these woods with no intention of walking out. All of that sadness and legend swirl through these trees and underbrush, creating an atmosphere even the most physically insensitive can feel. The legends of Aoki Gahara are plentiful. Locals won't venture into the forest at night. Compasses don't work. Visitors get lost and can't find their way out, driving them to madness. And ghosts walk everywhere, luring in others to bring fresh spirits to the woods. This may sound like the stuff of fiction, but there are tangible reasons why these legends hold up inside of Jukai. There are dead bodies out there right now. In so much forest, suicide victims can go months or even years before being found. Sometimes only skeletons in tattered clothing are discovered, and many are left there to continue to rot on display for other hikers who venture off the beaten path, a practice that is illegal, discouraged by signs near the trails, and monitored by police via remote video cameras. I'm always eager to get to the root of any legend. If we can find the beginning and trace the root, we can learn a lot about a haunted location. Aoki Gahara Jukai has been a place many tried to avoid for centuries. Even before the modern era epidemic of suicides, the Japanese people avoided this land. For one, there was no real reason to go in, no natural resources that couldn't be found easier elsewhere, but there were also stories of people going in, getting lost, and never coming out. In the 19th century, this place was a popular location to commit the act of ubasute, the practice of abandoning an elderly relative so they died of starvation or dehydration. Goodness. Combine those old practices and superstitions with hundreds of suicides and you have land infused with ghosts. This place is one of Japan's most profound paranormal sites, not just because of the eerie look and dark practices of the past, but because of a 1960 novel penned by Japanese author Saicho Matsumoto called Kuroi Jukai, which translates to the Black Sea of Trees. Matsumoto authored many mystery and detective novels, but Kuroi Jukai featured two star-crossed lovers who end up taking their own lives in the Aoki Gahara Jukai. This romantic Shakespearean tale gave some depressed readers the idea that Aoki Gahara Jukai was a good place to go end their lives. 
Inside a sea of trees, one could wander far away from people and drown out one's life in total privacy. The corpse wouldn't be discovered for years, maybe not ever. In the 1960s, this otherwise peaceful forest found itself the setting for one suicide after another. Matsumoto's book has become a literal part of the legend because moldy, wet copies of the tome have been found on the ground in the forest and sometimes at the feet of a victim. Being suicidal is a tragic sickness that can affect people from all walks of life. Sadly, these actions are also contagious, contagious among peer groups. When one friend commits suicide, it plants those same thoughts among other close friends and family and contagious with locations. As mentioned earlier, San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge draws in dozens of people each year who intend to jump to their deaths. Aoki Gahara Jukai follows the same story, though with a tall bridge, gravity does the dirty deed for you. In a forest, you must do the killing yourself. I'm sorry, this just keeps getting more and more grim. Legends are living, breathing entities in and of themselves. They are born, they feed, they grow, they can give birth to offspring, and they can die. Attention is what feeds a legend. With each new suicide, the legend of the forest grew. Each death leaves some new tragic mark on the land, and the paranormal begins to compound, growing exponentially. Saicho Matsumoto wasn't the only author to consider the forest a good place to take one's life. In July of 1993, author Wotaru Tsurumi published his controversial and best-selling book called The Complete Manual of Suicide. In the book, he calls the forest the perfect place to die, though by 1993, the dark forest reputation had already been solidified, putting the idea in print again only fed the legend further. Inside the forest, suicide reached epidemic proportions. When you first walk into the woods, you see a large sign pleading with you to ask for help if you need it. The sign translates to, your life is a precious gift from your parents. Think about them and the rest of your family. You don't have to suffer alone. Call us to talk. Then it lists the police station phone number. Other signs offer numbers for credit counseling services. What sounds initially funny makes sense when you consider the high value the Japanese place on employment and earning money. Financial trouble is one of the leading causes for suicide among Japanese people. When you first walk onto the trails, you pass by sensors at the trailhead. The sensors are used to try to count the number of people who go in and to see if the numbers match those coming out. Of course, it's a giant forest, and if one wanted to go around the sensors, it takes only a few steps and a few extra seconds to avoid being counted. Once inside the forest, you're confronted with ancient trees with roots that creep and crawl around rocks and land like veins coming up from the earth. One local described the woods as having eyes below you because volcanic activity from Mount Fuji's last eruption in AD 1707 wore small tunnels and caves throughout the forest. It's like the underworld is peering at you from those eyes of the earth. When you see the signs that say, don't kill yourself, what started as a nice walk in the woods suddenly becomes a little macabre, said Adam Karstens, who lived in Japan between 2007 and 2009. It is spooky in there. What an interview that was. Here's a picture of the signs that, are, that greet you when you walk in. People do get lost inside, even in modern times. There are ropes tied to trees to help guide you back to main trails and toward the exit. Hopefully those same ropes don't offer more ideas to those passing through. Once inside at night, visitors speak of hearing the cries of the Uri, the ghost of a life taken prematurely. The legend says that the Uri will cry through the night until its corpse is found. It may even lift its corpse to bring it closer to living people out of a desperate need for company. It's believed to be bad luck to leave a corpse rotting in the woods, so local crews regularly scout the forest looking for bodies in order to remove them. Many go unclaimed and aren't identifiable because of advanced decomposition, so they must suffer an anonymous burial. People who own businesses nearby or those who live near the trails will tell you they can usually tell who is going to the forest for a nature hike and who has no intention of returning. Jacob, who works at a local cafe, said one night he saw a figure walk out of the Jukai and at first thought it was a ghost, but soon realized it was a haggard person who had been sleeping in the woods. Jacob said this person had no money and obviously meant to die. Fortunately, Jacob took him in, gave him a ride to his house where he stayed for two days, then gave him some money to get back to Tokyo on the train. Lisa Lee Harp Waugh is a necromancer and sensitive to the world of the dead. 
She had the opportunity to visit the suicide forest in September of 2008. While standing near a tree in the forest, her body became possessed by one of the ghosts who haunt the woods. She said, those with me, a group of 10 people, said I spoke beautiful Japanese and my face changed to take on that of the dead man's ghost who took over my body. He went on to tell them how he had hung himself from the very tree that I am standing by. The man inside me told him of how he had died and that his hanging was actually botched and he died from starvation and lack of water during a five-day period until someone came along deep in the woods and found his lifeless body. He went on to say that he would do it again if he had to do it over, but would use another method so he would not suffer as he did. He also spoke of the many real ghosts that came to watch him die. He spoke to the group in a perfect dialect from the area of Fuji Kawaguchiko. My companion said it was flawless. He told of how his wife had left him to move to another nearby town with another man and how she disgraced him and his family. I was very weak as the ghost left my body and I fell to the ground, shaken by this to my very soul. I was not aware that I was fully taken over. I must tell you that this was the first time something like this ever occurred to me in my life. The people with me later said to look at my ripped clothes from where I tried to tear at my own skin. Four of those present said they had to hold me down to stop me from running away or hurting myself or them. Here's another picture of the forest. Almost every culture has some kind of day or celebration to commemorate their dead. Many English-speaking countries celebrate Halloween. Catholics have All Souls Days, typically November 1st. Mexico has Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, celebrated November 1st and 2nd. And in Japan, they have the Festival of Oban, a Japanese Buddhist custom to honor the spirits of our ancestors. Oban is celebrated from the 13th to the 15th day of the seventh month of the year. Sounds like an inefficient way of saying mid-July, doesn't it? The reason for the discrepancy is that some parts of Japan follow the solar calendar, putting Oban in July, while other parts of the country follow a lunar calendar, which would put it in mid-August. Oban is the time when deceased ancestors come back to visit their living relatives, and it's customary for the living to make offerings to their departed kin. Oban is a busy time of year for the suicide forest. Some visitors come to Aoki Kahara Jukai because they believe they're being plagued by the restless spirit of a family member who took his or her own life here. The hope is that an offering might give the spirit peace. Walking in the forest is a haunting experience. One visitor who asked that she not be named said it was like we were being watched from all angles. You'd see people's personal items like clothes, shoes, glasses, journals, and photos. A framed baby photo near a noose made of neckties was the most disturbing thing I saw because I could imagine the child dying and its parents being driven to suicide over the grief. This stuff was all over the place. There are, there are reminders of the Jukai's dark reputation everywhere, and not just in the posted signs. Local shopkeepers will tell you they talk people out of dying by suicide there almost every day. There's something about these woods that lures the suicidal into deadly action. Call it the spirit of the place, call it an aura of disaster, but it's there lurking in the woods of the Aoki Gahara Jukai. And that, my friends, concludes this week's edition of Spooky Story Tuesdays with the theme of cemeteries. Um, and I wanted to make one note uh, before we left that one of the major themes of the Visitations comic books are uh, based on Chicago cemeteries, and I forgot to mention that earlier. So I think that the cemetery in the comic books is called Grace Hill, but it's based on Rose Hill and Graceland. So I wanted to throw that in there. And one more time, I will show you the copy of my book that came. Yay, it's so cute. And um, thank you for joining me tonight. Next week, we will continue. I have not selected a theme for next week yet, so if you have any ideas uh, or requests, do leave them in the comments. And um, hopefully I will see you again next Tuesday, same time, same place, 6 p.m. Central. All right, bye, everybody.